All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Borowski, and I will be your host for today. And I am not in my basement office. I am on the Ooster Sky Day. We are in the Pacific Ocean, and we are sailing. We are making our way along the coast of Peru, and we are heading to Ecuador. So I kind of have the best seat in the house right now. Let me switch my camera around, and let me give you a little taste of what the best seat is uh in the house looks like here we go all right so here we go it's a beautiful morning here we just got called for breakfast a few minutes ago there's the stern the back of the ship so you can see some of the crew quarters we've got our dutch flag flying back there and the wheelhouse captain the wheelhouse is back there we've got nothing but beautiful pacific ocean stretching as far as you can see out to the horizon and then you can see that we don't have our masts up right now or any sails up right now. Uh, in the night, we lost the wind. So before we went to bed, we took all the sails down. And this morning, hopefully we'll get a little bit of wind. The flag, I can see it moving at the back a bit. So with any luck, we'll be setting some sails soon. Uh, and then we will rip uh, along the ocean. Yesterday, we were doing about five knots. So maybe we can do a little bit better today. Uh, but here we go. It is a beautiful, beautiful morning. On the Ooster Scal Day, we're going to move around the ship in a little bit. So we will explore the ship a little bit. We'll test uh, the limits of our connectivity. So I might freeze up a little bit sometimes, but we'll figure it out. I've got my amazing colleague, Jesse, hiding out backstage. He was on the ship uh, a week or so ago. and He sailed from Valparaiso, Chile to uh, Lima in Peru. So there we go. So we've got a jam-packed event today. Let me turn the camera around and let us get right into it. We've got guests joining us today. We have experiments. We've got our curiosity. But what I want to start off with is before I got on board the ship, I came to Peru early. And I spent a week in an incredible place called Manu National Park. So we're going to have a presentation here. I'm going to take you on a little Amazon adventure to get things started. So we've got this nice map up here. Uh, you can see this very green part of Peru. So Manu National Park is untouched rainforest, primary rainforest, it's never been logged, and it is about 17,000 square miles of rainforest. And so we're gonna jump into the next photo here and I'm gonna take you on a little adventure with me. And so to start our, our adventure, we started in the cloud forest. We were pretty high up, maybe around kind of getting close to 4,000 meters up in the cloud forest. And this is where the rivers begin. There's a lot of rainfall, and this is the source of a lot of the rivers. So I spent time on a river called the Madre dos Rios. So that's the river of God. And it eventually goes through Peru into Bolivia, and connects with the Amazon River, flows through Brazil, uh, and then makes its way out to the Atlantic Ocean. So. Birds are amazing. This is an ant pita. These are really hard birds to see. They're very endemic, which means you only find them in tiny spots, different locations. And so spotting this guy <clears throat> was very exciting. Only appeared from the bush for about 10 seconds to get this photo. So as we jump on to another picture here, I can show you some more stuff. We visited a place called Waiketcha Cloud Forest Station. So it's a biological station where they do experiments in the field. And some of you may recognize Ruth Pilko. This is Ruth. She joined us uh, two weeks ago now uh, from the field station. And so she's working on an amazing project with the Andean bear. She's using uh, camera traps to track the bears. She's trapping the bears and putting radio collars on them. And then she's collecting information like from their scat, from their poop, to learn more about how healthy they are and what they're eating. In some of these next pictures, I have a few images of some wildlife. So this is a collared honey creeper uh, eating some fruit in the cloud forest. In the next picture, this is a swordbill hummingbird. So this hummingbird, compared to its body, has the longest bill, the longest beak of any bird. You can see how big it is. It's holding its head up to, to keep it from tipping forward. Uh, in the next picture, we have a little peak of a blue-banded toucanet. So there's two cans, which can be pretty big. And then there's our blue banded toucanet, which are a little bit smaller, the toucanets. Now it's time to change gears. We made our way out of the cloud forest. 
it gets really flat and we enter something called the Amazon Basin. And so this is our transportation, the roads end and we have to get in these little motorized canoes and we jump out into the river. So that Satu is my guide. He was my guide in the field. Uh, you see him sitting there next to me. He's pretty excited. And then it was time to hike. It was time to explore and see some wildlife. So hummingbirds are always beautiful. And what I love about hummingbirds in this next picture, this is the same species of hummingbird. If we flip to the next picture, it turned its head and those feathers, those beautiful iridescent feathers, they catch the light uh, and they look absolutely incredible. So the same bird, depending on how you look at it, you might think it's a different species, a completely different bird. All right, <clears throat> this is such a cool hummingbird. This is the Rufus booted racket tail. In the next picture, you get a little better look at its tail. So you can see the little racket tail. And then it looks like it's wearing those little brown boots, those little Rufus colored boots. And look at that front, look at that throat, how iridescent it is when it catches the lights. This is the national bird of Peru. So pretty much every country has its national bird. And the national bird of Peru is the cock of the rock. So this is the male. And the male, all year long, they get together in groups. It's called the... Uh, when the females come, they watch these dances and they pick the male who they think is doing the best dance. So if we jump ahead, there's another nice picture of the cock of the rock. The national bird of Peru. Very, very cool. All right. In this part of the rainforest, there are monkeys. I think there's 12 or 13 species of monkeys in Peru. And this is one species here. This is the woolly monkey. So it lives a little bit higher up. And that's why it has so much fur uh, to keep it warm in the forest. And then a little later on in the presentation, we will see some more uh, of Peru's monkey species. So that's the woolly monkey uh, in the rainforest. Another little hummingbird here. I couldn't uh, resist putting in this Rufus uh, coquette. You can see it's got this beautiful little crest on top of its head. This is a very small hummingbird. This hummingbird would have probably been as about as big as my thumb, just a little bit, a little bit wider than my thumb, this hummingbird. So really cool to get to see this Rufus crested uh, coquette. And the toucan. So we saw a toucanette. These are the bigger toucans. This is a white throated toucan. It was nice enough to pose for a picture for me. And then I want to show you this picture here, this, this, uh, this tree boa, this green boa. These snakes are incredibly hard to find. Their camouflage for the rainforest is pretty beautiful. They are constrictors, so they're not venomous, no, no poison bite, but they will bite their prey and they'll wrap around and they'll slowly squeeze and squeeze and suffocate uh, their prey. So I have a couple more shots, a couple little glamour shots uh, of this boa, this beautiful, beautiful green boa. I think there's one more shot. There we go. A nice look at the eye uh, of this green boa. Okay. I'm going to take you on the river now. So we're going to play this little clip. This is near the start of our journey. So it looks like the drone is playing nicely. So I had my drone with me so I could do some flights like this. So this is the Madre dos Rios. The road is over. This is our highway through Manu National Park. You can see that for as far as you can see, it is rainforest. There's still a little bit of mountain here, but it's flattening out. As we got a little bit further down into the basin uh, of the Amazon, it became totally flat, uh, nothing to see there. And then in this clip, there's a little island in the middle of the river. The rivers are always changing flow, changing shape, cutting sections off into oxbow lakes. Uh, the river is pretty dynamic. Any given season, the river is going to be completely different. So the the river pilots uh, using those canoes have to be keep their eyes out. This little outpost where we caught our uh, river canoe. So you get a view down there of all the canoes along the side of the river. And then this next little video clip is just a little hyperlapse of what it's like to be sitting in the canoe uh, and making your way down the river. There we go. So again, as you watch this, we don't pass any other boats. 
So I spent basically five days with no other people, no electricity, no hot water, uh, sweating. It's very, very hot in the rainforest. But wow, what a place to be. What biodiversity. And we're just going to take a look at a little biodiversity before we, we wrap up and do a little Kahoot uh, together. We'll have a guest speaker join us after that. And then we'll get into some of our experiments. So the river is not only a highway for us when we're on the river, but the animals have to cross it. This is a white collared peccary. So you can see it's a little, little pig species. And the water was very high because it rained the night before. And this peccary was having a very hard time swimming across the river. But in the next photo, you can see that it made it safely to the other side. Uh, so it can dry off in the sun. I'm sure there was some reason to cross the river, maybe some food on the other side. Maybe it was part of its territory. Uh, I don't know for sure what it was thinking. We parked the canoe at one stage and did a big hike into the jungle and we found a nest of the harpy eagle. This is an eagle with a two meter wingspan. It's the largest eagle. They are very hard to see in the rainforest. They're very rare. And if you look carefully in front, this one has a chick. So this chick wouldn't have hatched that long ago. In the next picture here of the harpy eagle, you get a look at its talons of its feet. They have massive feet. The talons, the claws, can be up to four or five inches long. That is the same size as the claws of a grizzly bear. So they cruise through the canopy and they ambush monkeys and sloths uh, in the canopy. They can carry things up to 17 pounds and then they bring them back to their nest uh, for their young. And then I think I have a little video clip here of one of the eagles coming back to the nest. And if you look carefully, you can see the little baby pop up uh, to see if there was any food that came back to the nest. Okay, I think I'm back. Yeah, I see the I see the Harpy Eagle video playing. All right, beautiful, amazing eagle. Uh, and then we spent a number of days at a place called Manu Bird Lodge. So this is just a drone clip. Uh, as the drone goes up, what I want you to notice is that as it does a spin, as it does a turn, there is nothing in sight but rainforest from horizon to horizon to horizon. We are in the middle of untouched rainforest, old growth rainforest. Um, yeah, so we'll get a little look here at rainforest and river just stretching from horizon to horizon to horizon. Absolutely beautiful place to be, a loud place to be, uh, full of bugs, so constantly out at night. All right, beautiful. Let's jump into some more photos here before our Kahoot. This is a clay lick. So these exposed areas are really popular with animals like parrots, parakeets, macaws. Mammals come like tapirs and deer because in their diet, they don't get all the minerals that they need. So when they visit these clay licks, we'll see a couple more pictures of the clay lick here. These are green and red macaws. They're able to eat a little bit of this clay and get some of those minerals, some of those salts that their bodies are missing. And then eventually they get kind of spooked and they kind of fly away. So here's a couple pictures uh, of those red and green macaws leaving the clay lick. I think there's one more shot of them flying out. There we go. Very cool. All right, jumping ahead. This was the highlight for me. Jaguars are very elusive, very shy species. And we spotted this beautiful jaguar. It had just crossed the river, so it was wet. Uh, we stopped the boat and we were able to watch it walk around uh, along the side of the river for a little bit. And it wasn't too happy we were there, but once it left, I was able to hop on shore and grab these pictures um, of the jaguar footprints in the fresh mud. Amazing to see 
Uh, totally, totally awesome. And then nighttime. Nighttime, you think it's time to go to bed? No, it is time to go out in the swamp. It is time to get bit by bugs. Bring your camera gear and see who comes out at night. So we've got, this is a poison dart frog. There are two species in this part of the rainforest. This is the smaller species of that poison frog. This is the largest ant in the world, the bullet ant. It has a powerful bite. You have a bite from a bullet ant, it hurts a lot, and you will feel it probably for the next 24 hours. You won't be feeling so good. Uh, in our next picture, we have some grasshoppers. So, so many insects come out at night. We've got these two beautiful colored grasshoppers. In our next picture, we have our frogs. So if you look carefully, you can find these tree frogs. You can find frogs on the ground. Their camouflage is beautiful, but if you get them at the right angle, uh, you can spot them and you can grab some pictures like this. This is a false viper. So it looks a little bit like a viper and that's on purpose to make other species kind of keep their distance, but this isn't a non-venomous snake, uh, a false viper. Caterpillars in the rainforest, beautiful colors. These are sweat bees. So these bees don't sting, but they are very annoying. So when I was waiting for those macaws to come, we were close to a nest of sweat bees and they were crawling all over us because they like the salt on our skin. Uh, they don't sting, but it's, it's very annoying when you have 30 or 40 of them crawling on you. Uh, and there's not much you could do about it. Uh, you can swat them, but more will just come. This is a, an Amazon boa. So similar to that tree boa that we saw, this is an Amazon boa. In the next picture, we get a little closer look at those beautiful purple eyes. And again, this snake isn't venomous. It's looking for something to grab like a frog or a small mammal. It'll wrap around tight and slowly, slowly suffocate it before swallowing it whole. Some more tree frogs. At night, you can find them by their calls. So you hear their calls. That's one way to find them. And then sometimes if you're using your flashlight, you can just catch a little reflection uh, of their eyes. And that's another way that you can kind of track them down. More insects in the rainforest. Some frogs. So this is all at night. This is a false spider, a whiptail, um, or, or sorry, a false scorpion, a whiptail spider. You can see it kind of has the pinchers, but doesn't have that tail um, like a scorpion does. And then this is a, a I think this is a species of waxy monkey frog. This is the last little picture from that night hike that I wanted to show you. And I visited one more spot. This is called an oxbow lake. So this is a little drone footage to show you what an oxbow lake looks like. But essentially as a river snakes its way through the rainforest, those bends, those turns, straight. And it leaves behind these little lakes, these little oxbow lakes, these kind of crescent shaped lakes where you can find bird species, mammals like the giant river otter. You can find caiman. So this is just a little drone shot of what it's like to explore one of those oxbow lakes. And in a second, we're going to get to see a little bit of the wildlife that you can find as you paddle. So we switched from a canoe to a little paddle boat, kind of like a little deck. Uh, and you can paddle that deck along uh, the Oxbow Lake. So some of the wildlife, this is a horned screamer. I did not know birds could have horns, but here you go. This is the unicorn of the bird world, the horned screamer. Next, we've got the Hoatzin. These are prehistoric, these are primitive birds. So this bird has four stomachs like a cow. It eats uh, plants, it leaves. And then it also, when they're young, they have little claws on their wings. So if they fall out of the nest, they can use those little claws to crawl back up uh, into their nest. We've got a little striated heron here, successfully caught its breakfast. Nice little fish that could even be a piranha from the little oxbow lake. And then in this drone footage, you will see a caiman. So there's two kinds of caiman. There's white caiman, there's black caiman. I think they can get up to about six meters. Uh, so about 18 feet, they can get pretty big. And this one here has a name. This one here is called Punchin. And Punchin uh, is pretty well known at this Oxbow Lake. Very curious about the boats. 
uh, and we'll follow the boats along. So in the next picture of Ponchine, we have a nice close up. Ponchine followed us all over the lake, but when we hit a certain territory, stopped and turned around. Because in this territory, we had a family of Amazon giant, uh, Amazon river otters. And so they hunt in a group, they dive and splash in the water, and then they catch fish. And when they catch the fish, they hold the fish and they spin little circles as they happily eat their fish. So the next pictures are a few shots of these giant river otters holding their fish uh, and having their, their morning meal. Now along the side of the river, you see these turtles sunning. And then on the turtles heads, the butterflies like to land because they get salt from the mouth and the eyes uh, of the turtle. So there's another shot here of, the, of a different turtle with some more butterflies landing on its head uh, and getting that salt that they like. And then in the next photo, we have our giant rodent, the biggest rodent in the world, the capybara. They are excellent, excellent swimmers. And then they are our favorite treat of the uh, things like caiman and the jaguar, especially. So the largest rodent, the capybara. And then we're just going to wrap up a couple monk more of those monkey species. We have the red howler monkey. Every morning at five o'clock, like an alarm clock, they start calling. You feel like you're in Jurassic Park when the howler monkeys start calling at five in the morning. It is, it is quite an unworldly sound. Then I think we have our saddleback tamarind next. There's our saddleback tamarind. They're pretty shy, so getting a picture of them, you kind of have to catch little moments when they pause for a second. And then next is our TD monkey. The TD monkeys were very curious, so they will stop and they'll look down at you. They'll try and figure out what's going on. So there is our TD monkey. And I think I got a picture there with the baby as well. So this one had a little baby riding on its back. And then to wrap us up, I slept outside on our last night on a platform with just a mattress and a mosquito net and waited by a little clay lick called a mammal lick. So this is on the ground, it's very small. And this tapir came out of the jungle. She came out in the middle of the night. She was pregnant, our guy thinks it was pregnant. And we just had a couple seconds. We turned on our spotlight, took a couple fast pictures before she went back into the jungle. You can see she's all dirty. She's got clay right up to the tops of her legs. Uh, and then, yeah, she was getting some of those, those minerals, those nutrients that were missing from her, her diet. So there we go. That is a whirlwind trip of the Peruvian Amazon in Manu National Park. And I think what we'll do now, we've got a guest speaker who will join us shortly. But before that, I think we should rock our Kahoot. So we're going to get our, our Kahoot loaded up in the background. I think I did five questions this morning. There's some true and false. There's some multiple choice. Jesse's got the pin number up there. You need to visit. Well, we're going to give Joe a second to get his connection back on, but hello, folks. Oh, there we are. You just cut out for a minute, so just let our audience know. Uh, Kahoot.it, the game pin is up. We're all good. We made it through the whole presentation before that, so that's very exciting. And uh, yeah. to wait, middle school, welcome in in the background hey, well, as well. I, think I found a nice, a nice connectivity sweet spot here on the Ooster Scale Day. <laughs> You did. Fantastic. Uh, but yeah, anyone who wants to join our Kahoot, we're going to give it a few more seconds, and then I'm going to dip back in the background. We'll dive in with that. And then our, our guest speaker, Callie, should be joining us soon, which is really, really exciting. But I'm so glad you all got the chance to witness uh, Joe's amazing Manu National Park uh, expedition. That he, he basically covered all the greatest things you can possibly see in the Peruvian rainforest. It's like my dream trip. So uh, yeah. lucky you, Joe. <laughs> Jesse, if you can hold down the fort for just one second, I'm going to send a quick message to our speaker. Perfect. I'll put you in the background while you do that. And uh, you guys are great. We've got a bunch of you now in the Kahoot. That's fantastic. For those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win is Joe and I's everlasting respect, which I think is pretty cool uh, as part of this world's most exciting classroom. Uh, again, for any of our students, if you want to check out any more of Joe's footage or pictures on his expedition in Manu, uh, this will go to our YouTube channel. It'll go to the Darwin 200 YouTube channel and Facebook page as well. So lots of opportunities to uh, make sure you catch all those images once again. I got Joe back with us. We got a bunch of people at our Kahoot. Shall we dive in and get underway? Yeah, I just want to remind the classes that Along with that everlasting respect, there is a $50 uh, Amazon card up for grabs. So 
Jesse will share the email. Uh, classroomatdarwin200.com is where you're going to want a message. But let's get right into it and let's see who comes on top uh, in today's Kahoot quiz. Fantastic. All right. We're going to. All right. Here we go. We're full screen. That usually means we're about to get live. There we go. We should have a three second count in into our Amazon quiz. All right, Manu National Park is 5,000 kilometers squared, 11,000 kilometers squared, 17,000 kilometers squared, or 23,000 kilometers squared. So how big did I say Manu National Park was at the beginning? 5,000, 11,000, 17,000, or 23,000 uh, kilometers squared? I'll tell you it's big. It is one big national park, um, and you have to give the government credit it's well protected there's a buffer zone around the park uh to protect it as well all right crew that is right 17 about 17,000 uh square kilometers let's see who's on our leaderboard Ooh, the friendly raccoon you can find raccoons in the rainforest which is pretty cool i did not see any raccoons though all right coming up on our next question a little true and false action the white crest or the white chested toucan is the national bird of Peru. Is that true or is that false? That the white chested toucan is the national bird of Peru. We've got a little picture decoding there to give you a hint if you need it. But is the white chested toucan the national bird of Peru? True or false? All right. It is false. It is the cock of the rock, that beautiful red bird with the black and white feathers. The cock of the rock is the national bird of Peru. That puts the glad pony in first place. Let's go to our next question. The largest rodent in the world, what is it? Is it the tapir? Is it the red howler monkey? Is it the capybara? Or is it the giant river otter? What is the, the largest rodent in the world? little picture decoding for you a big hint only one of those animals is a rodent they are all mammals i did see all of them uh, but only one of them is a rodent and only one of them is the largest rodent uh, in the world a few more seconds to get your answers locked in all right the capybara good job crew let's check our leaderboard before we go to another question Ooh, glad pony holding on, but the uh, eager alpaca is on fire. They are right behind. Harpy eagle talons can be as big as grizzly bear claws. Is that true or is that false? So the talons, the claws can be as big as grizzly bear claws. True or false? A few more seconds to get your answers locked in. All right, that is true. Good job, crew. Any movement? Ooh, Glad Pony is not going to let go. Not at this moment. So we have one more question. Let's get that final question in. Uh, and then, yeah, let's see how we do. Macaws, parrots, and parakeets go to Claylix to find minerals missing from their diets. Is that true or is that false? Are those birds, those parrots, those parakeets, those macaws, are they looking for things that are missing from their diet? True or false? All right, that is absolutely true. Great way to end off with that question and those correct answers. In third place, we have, oh, that's hard to see, the balanced chicken. Oh, that went fast on second. Jesse might have to read out second place for me. That went really fast. But the glad pony is there in first place. Yes, our friendly raccoon came in second. Glad Pony first place. Let us know who you are. Again, classroom at Darwin 200. If you want to send us a little bit of a note, uh, we'd love to get you that gift card. Joe, that was spectacular. And it looks like our star of the show part two after your Amazon adventure is here with us. Uh, so I'm going to turn you over to Callie to, to take us away. <laughs> Amazing. Let's get Callie into the call. Hi, Callie. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. Looks like you are outside. I Well, I mean, I am in the middle of Pacific Ocean, Callie. 
That's awesome. <laughs> we fun. are sailing the high seas. Uh, I should introduce you quick. This is Callie Broadus. Callie Broadus is my friend. She is an Explorers Club 50. She is the founder of Reserva Youth Land Trust. So an amazing coalition of youth from around the world. Uh, and they've been doing some incredible fundraising, creating the world's first fully funded by youth uh, land reserve in the cloud forest of Ecuador. Cali, it is so great to have you as our guest today. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So I guess I we're, we're fast, right? I'm going to dive yeah, let's, in let's, and lightning let's, talk let's, this. Let's jump right in. We are sailing to Ecuador right now. So I thought you'd be the perfect person to take us uh, into those beautiful forests. Well, first of all, I'm so jealous, but you guys are going to have such an amazing time. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to bring up. Can you see this? I think it's coming up. There we go. Beautiful. All right. So I know y'all are heading to, uh, are you heading to the Galapagos? We will eventually. We're going to start in Waikil. We've got to clean up the bottom of the ship. And then from there, we'll go to the Galapagos. Okay. All right. So I'm going to take you to a completely different world from the Galapagos. Um, so before I dive in, I just want to say what I'm going to be talking about. It's not just my work. Um, it's really the work of a lot of different organizations and people. Uh, so we have a bunch of partners, but but also this group of folks down at the bottom here, that's the Reserve of Youth Council. So these are uh, just a, a fraction of the people who who are part of my organization. They're youth from all around the world working together to uh, create and support protected areas and biodiversity hotspots. So couldn't do any of this without them. So we're going to be in Ecuador. And Ecuador has three main bioregions. We have the Amazon off to the east. And then that big spine down the middle, that's the Andes Mountains. Um, there are eastern slopes and western slopes of those mountains. And we are going to be working here on the western slopes. And as you go further down toward the coast, um, that's the Chaco uh, kind of lowland rainforest that hits the um that hits the ocean but where we're working is here on the western slopes of these andes mountains it's the most endemic biodiversity hotspot in the world um and this that term end endemic um comes from endemism which is the quality of an area to be completely unique um, compared to other areas so you can have species um, that are endemic to uh, a country or to a region or even to one side of one mountain. And this area where we're working is, is incredibly, incredibly endemic. Um, the reserve I'm going to be talking about is called Dracula Reserve. And if you can see the map here on the left, um, those little red dots, that's up on our, the border isn't really well defined here, but that's on the border of Ecuador and Colombia. And uh, it's a reserve that now is about 6,000 acres in size, creating a corridor between two other um, semi-protected areas. And it's not named after the count. It's named after this really wild looking genus of orchids. This one's actually a new species to science. Um, does not yet have a name, but um, the Dracula orchids are named for these super long sepals that make them look like little dragons. So um, the main reason that we need to conserve this area other than kind of the classic the classic regions, reasons of agricultural deforestation and, and just human pressures in general is that this region is blanketed in mining concessions. And um, if you can see this little, this little uh, kind of vein of shiny gold metal here, um, that is, it's pyrite. It's kind of a mix of gold pyrite. We don't really know what, but this is what gold miners are looking for and, and mining companies are looking for when they explore for the potential of opening a mine in this region. And what it looks like is, um, is like this. So, so this, if you see off to the right, there's a, a stream that is a Canyon that's been explored, um, illegally by a, by, a, um, an Australian mining company. And, uh, and it's is wide open. You can just see all the way up, and it's created a landslide that has utterly destroyed um, huge amounts of habitat. Off to the left, there's actually an intact canyon, and you can barely see it. Um, it's where my cursor is. If you can see that this this stream, it goes up. It's a mirror image of the one on the right, 
but you can't see it because that's what the forest is supposed to look like. So when we go to this, uh, to this area to do field work, um, we are trying to collect evidence that this area needs to be protected from extraction like mining. Um, so the, the big effort that we made, um, we've made two massive projects here. The first was called Dracula Youth Reserve. That was right here. Um, and it was 244 acres entirely funded by youth. It was actually a 1,219 acre project that we funded um, in part the whole thing. Um, and then after finding some gold mining, we decided to double down and, and help um, protect, help expand the reserve. Um, and we, we teamed up with Orchid Conservation Alliance to protect 1,050 acres in this area. So um, that's kind of our fundraising side. But today I want to talk about the on the ground, nitty gritty, um, getting muddy and seeing what really lives here. So um, this is us with Explorers Club Flag 211, um, one of our one of our teams, um, really international team of youth, youth, young scientists and storytellers, as well as our local team. And uh, what we do is we go in and we, we look at a number of different things and it changes on every expedition, depending on which experts we're able to bring with us. Um, on this particular expedition, we were exploring a site that had never been explored by scientists. So we kind of had to do a wide range of things. We needed to evaluate the forest quality, look at different species groups, and also document it as well as we could. So what we found was that the forest quality in this area was some of the most incredible forest I've ever seen. And I hope you can hear this. Um, but in the cloud forest, you kind of can always hear the dripping of water. Um, it's a it's basically a high altitude rainforest. And in the morning, the clouds are below you. So you, you look out over this huge landscape. And then by afternoon, it kind of looks like this, where the clouds are just among you, just living in the clouds. Um, super steep, very difficult to hike here. Um, but that, that quality of forest was exactly what we were hoping it would be. It was primary forest. Um, it also played host to a huge amount of bird life. And uh, this is my one, my one little um, fieldwork video clip I'm going to share. And Joe, if you can interrupt me when I'm, when I'm at like, I don't know, five minutes or something, um, because I know, you know, I can just go on. Um, but this is, uh, this is what it really feels like to be in camp on an expedition. Um, this is our, our birding team. It's 6.31 in the morning. How I feel, I'm very excited to see what we catch today. I'm also quite tired and very muddy. However, it's a good day. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. So birds start um, the activity early morning. But the first uh, sunlight, they will uh, start moving. They will start looking for food. This is the beginning. This is the most productive hour during the day. Listen. So actually, this is the first time ever in the history of this place a scientific ex expedition has been held. No one has ever bring even binoculars to this place. So this is actually every everything is a new discovery. This is one of the um, real failures of this forest. It's the violet tail silk. Four grams. <laughs> so, so tiny. <laughs> it's juvenile, but it's not super juvenile because the feathers. Remember. This tail can go until here. So we know that it's on development. 
and it's part of the of the distinctions to a juvenile. Because it's growing. Yes. So, uh, the, so Callie, I'll just pop in and give you a five minute warning, but perfect. amazing, Callie. The pictures, the video, amazing. Perfect. Okay, great. So the birds team, that's our, those are our early birds. Um, our, the folks who have to wake up at five every single morning, set those nets and take those surveys. And, um, and we, we found on this site that there are high populations of some birds um, that are under like a kind of a high priority for conservation in the area um, called purplish mountain, purplish mantled tanagers. And um, so we're really glad to have a, a good population of those there, um, reasons for conservation. Um, so the herps team are kind of the polar opposite. They go out late at night. Um, they do some surveys in the middle of the day, but mostly they have dinner and then right around 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. they head out and they're looking for frogs. They're looking for salamanders. Um, they're looking for snakes. And I want to pause on this guy because this is it's a new species to science. Um, but this group of, of species, um, the genus is called Bolitoglossa. And it's one of the coolest animals that we have in the cloud forest. Um, it's a lungless arboreal salamander. So it has no lungs. It breathes through its skin. It lives in the trees. Um, and it supposedly has the fastest tongue in the animal kingdom. Um, but they are, they're incredibly cute. They kind of paddle as they walk. Um, so they're, they're kind of my favorite thing to find. Um, but this expedition was particularly successful because of this find. Um, this is called a plump toad. Uh, it's a sort of Frene is the genus, Occidentalis is the species, and that's an endangered species. And it was not known to be in this area. It wasn't known to be in the entire, um, the entire province. And this is the first documented case of this uh, of this species existing here and having a new endangered species on this site is a super important and valuable find it'll help us defend this place from gold mining because we can say if you want to explore here you're going to be impacting the ability of this species to survive um, and thanks to the rights of nature in ecuador it's illegal to cause the extinction of a species um, Orchids are a huge part of our work there. Um, this is this is an orchid that's about half an inch wide. And this is one of our biggest that we'll see there. Most of our orchids are absolutely tiny and they're called micro orchids. And we have about 400 species of orchids, many of which are new to science. Um, and then before we sign off, I wanna show you some of my favorite little creatures. Um, this was one of the coolest moments for me in the field. It's a Western mountain coati, which is a near threatened species. And unlike the coatis you may see in, in um, kind of fed by tourists in resorts in South America, um, this is a different species. It's super secretive, very hard to find. And that was a baby that came up about a foot from our boots. Um, it was about the size of a pine cone. And uh, it's just an, an, an incredible um, example of the, the mammal's life that, that stays hidden in this forest. And very lastly, the weirdest thing I've ever seen here. This is a six foot long earthworm. And um, we have it identified down to genus level, but I don't know we're going to get further than that for the moment. We just have to hope we find one again. We found this crossing the road on our way out. Um, and... And as you can see, it's um, it's just tremendous in size. Uh, so there it was on the on the road, and um, obviously this this thing caused quite a stir on on social media. iNaturalist made it the observation of the week, and uh, and it's just something I really hope I can find when I come back. Um, we don't know if it's an endangered species. We have no idea because uh, we can't identify it to that level. But what local people tell us is that the eagles will take these. So you'll see eagles swooping down onto the road and picking them up with these massive worms. So important part of the food chain. Uh, but that's that's it for me. And thank you so much. I, I, I hope that you visit the cloud forest one day in Ecuador. All right. Callie, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to see the work that you're doing, the incredible team, the youth that you work with. In fact, that's our first question. Do you have... Um, a story or an example of maybe a project 
something someone did to raise some money. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've done, um, well, we've done a bunch of group fundraisers, like Run for the Rainforest is probably our biggest group fundraiser, uh, where we did a virtual 5K all over the world. We're actually going to be relaunching this soon. Uh, we haven't titled it yet. Run for the Reef, Run for the uh, a Sprint for the Sea, trot, Turtle Trot. We don't know what it's called yet, but we're going to be recreating this to raise funds for our new marine project in Panama. But um, we also, we've also had a couple youth do youth members do their own fundraisers. One guy ran a um, an ultra marathon in one day. He ran 45 miles along the coast of Wales and raised a few thousand dollars. We had someone who was really good at identifying insects, bio blitz his neighbor's backyards and in return for a species list, they made a donation to the project. Um, and then we had someone organize an online concert where Olivia Rodrigo actually came and sang uh, a couple songs. Um, we had some really cool artists who played on Instagram Live. And that was back in the middle of the pandemic when no one had anything else to do but go online. <laughs> so uh, we've had some pretty, pretty interesting fundraisers. All right. That's amazing, Callie. Uh, very cool to hear those stories. Youth taking initiative. Our next question is about the cloud forest itself. So what's the most challenging thing about working in the cloud forest? Oh my gosh, the mud, the mud. Um, it is whether you're hiking. I mean, there are a lot of different challenging things about working in the cloud forest. You're, you're very far from medical care. You know, there's no cell service or anything. So you're working with satellite, um, just satellite communications. Um, it's super steep there. Uh, the first hike I ever did there was, um, took about six hours to go half of a mile. So it's, uh, it's just like this. And, but what makes it really hard is because it's such a wet reason, region, um, the mud, especially on areas that are widely traveled, mean that it means that every step you take, you're actually sliding back almost the entire step. And sometimes you'll step and the mud will go all the way up to your knees and you have to have help getting pulled out. And so it just makes it slow and laborious to get through. And then of course you drop your camera in the mud, you get your gear in the mud and you're just, there's just no way to keep anything clean. Um, so yeah, the mud and, and humidity in general, the humidity will get into the lens, fog it up and there's just very little you can do. So it's, it's a challenging environment. All right. And then Callie, one more question here for you about, uh, the mining about, uh, when you're in the rainforest, have you ever encountered any of the miners or poachers in the rainforest? Yeah. So, um, poachers, uh, I have not encountered personally, but we've seen them on um, trail cams. And mostly that's local people who will take their dogs into the forest and they, they know that they are not allowed to. They, there are signs everywhere. Um, this is not, it's not necessarily a case of, of like, you know, preventing people from accessing, um, you know, food or anything. This is, this is totally illegal. Um, poaching monkeys, critically endangered monkeys, things like that. Um, so we do find them on the camera traps, but I've never encountered them. Um, but gold miners, yes. And uh, the first time was we actually found a, a bunch of damage, like 400 meters of damage in a canyon, but the miners weren't actually there. Um, and we put our drone up into the air because it looked fresh and we wondered if they might still be around. And they were. Um, there was a camp about 500 meters from our camp, really close to the canyon. And um, we actually kind of got everyone out of camp and then gathered our camera gear and hiked in at five in the morning to surprise them before they woke up. And that was sort of our that was sort of our safety thing was we figured if we walked into this camp um, and had cameras rolling and were flanked by park guards with machetes that uh, hopefully they would be less likely to react violently if that was something they would do um, and just sort of be caught off guard. And that's exactly what happened. They um, they were totally caught off guard. We woke them up and um, they came out and told us, we got them to tell us who they were working for and um, like the names of their bosses. And of course, these are just, they're just workers, you know, they're working for $20 a day 
to do this. Um, and the real problem is, is the, the people who are in charge, not following the law and not, you know, not encouraging their local teams and mandating that their local teams respect property boundaries. So, um, yeah, I've had a couple. All right. Well, Callie, it's been such a pleasure to have you with us. You, your team, all the youth are doing such incredible work, such important and valuable work, and you get to do it. Your your office sometimes is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Look who's uh, talking. <laughs> well, yeah, this isn't too bad of an office for today. No question. Yeah. Callie, thank you so much. Thank you for taking us in the biodiversity uh, of the cloud forest in Ecuador today. Always a pleasure. Have all fun. Right, Callie, we'll We'll talk to you soon. All right. We are good timing today. I think this might be the first time in weeks and weeks and weeks where I haven't overstuffed our, our world's most exciting classroom. We're not going to run long today, I think. Now that I say that, we're obviously going to run long. But uh, we need to catch up on our experiments. So we have a little video. A couple of weeks ago, we had our growing crystals and baking soda experiment. So Jesse is going to queue up... Um, the video for us. Let's take a look at the results from the experiment and then we're going to have a brand new experiment for you. I'm going to change venue. Welcome back everyone. How did your baking soda crystal growing experiment go? Well, these are my results that I set up two weeks ago. Let's have a look at them. As you can see, I've grown lots of these weird white baking soda crystals on the string. Did you have similar results in your experiment? And could you work out why the crystals grew in this manner? Well, let's have a look at my experiment and see if we can work out what's happened. As you can see, both the red baking soda solution and the yellow baking soda solution were drawn up by capillary action through the string. The string is fibrous, so naturally water evaporates off along the length of the string, concentrating the baking soda solution in the string itself. When it gets to a point of saturation, the baking soda crystallizes out, as you can see has happened here. As you can see with my experiment, most of the crystals have grown closer to the red solution here. And very few, or really none at all, have grown here at the top of this yellow solution. This might be simply because the yellow solution is less concentrated, so perhaps it moves more easily along the string and the more concentrated red solution concentrates and saturates out form the crystals more readily. I was a bit surprised how white my crystals are. I thought more of the food coloring would have been taken up and drawn up through the string and concentrated in the crystals, but mine are actually quite white. But interestingly, the crystals that are formed here are a mix of the two colors. If you look closely, they're orange, which makes sense because they're mixing the red and the yellow solutions. This formation process of these crystals is similar to what happens in caves. Although it's a little bit different, in caves, water drips down from the ceiling that contains a solution of calcium carbonate. As the water drips down from the cave ceiling, it leaves behind a little bit of that calcium carbonate on the ceiling, and that gradually forms stalactites on the ceiling and stalagmites on the floor, and many other formations within the caves. Although it is slightly different, in a way it's similar here because as the water has has been lost, in this case, been evaporated off. It's left behind those concentrations of baking soda, forming these amazing crystal formations that in some ways are a little bit reminiscent of some of those caves. So next time you're in a cave, look up at the ceiling, look at those amazing stalactite formations, and remember the formation of your baking soda crystals. Thank you for taking part. All right, so you can see that was our experiment from two weeks ago uh, with the growing uh, baking soda crystals. Uh, I hope you tried that at home. I hope you tried that in the classroom. You can see I've changed venue now. I've gone below decks. I am in the salon here of uh, the Ooster Scalde. It's a beautiful meeting area where we have all of our meals. We do presentations here sometimes. It's a great spot if people need to get a little bit of work done. They can come hang out. Uh, down here in the salon, a great hangout spot. I'm gonna switch my camera view because we have an experiment this week and I have a guest with us who is gonna help out with our experiment. There we go, let's do a switch. Perfect, all right. 
here is Kate Bosler. Kate, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Great. Well, Kate is joining us. Kate is a fellow of the Explorers Club. She's an environmental journalist. And she was the easiest person to rope into doing uh, our experiment today. So today's experiment is going to be a really simple one, uh, looking at surface tension and water. So it's just some things we found around the ship. We have this bowl here. It's got the nice monogrammed Osterskalde there. Very nice. It's filled with water. And now Kate is going to put some pepper into that water. And this is not just any pepper. This is freshly ground pepper that we have here. And we're going to put it into the water. There we go. Yeah, let's get some more in there, Kate. Let's get it nice right. and peppered. Peppered up. Uh, nice and seasoned. All right. Perfect. Oh, I think we're back. Connection is back. Okay, so Kate is going to take some of this dish soap. She's going to get it onto her finger. There we go. All right, All right. The truth. let's do it. Let's put that finger. Uh, there we go. We got our connectivity back. So there we go. This week, we would like to see you replicate this one. This should be a nice and easy one to replicate in the classroom, or you can replicate it at home uh, with your parents. And then we'd like you to tell us, well, send us in a picture, but also tell us what happened. Why did the pepper react like that? Why did it move like that when Kate uh, put her finger in with the dish soap? So classroom.darwin200.com, you have two weeks to get your answers in. We want to see some photos. We want to see that answer. What do you think happened? What uh, caused the pepper to react that way? Two weeks to get it in, and there are some 50-pound Amazon gift cards on the line. So we're looking forward to seeing what you've got. Kate, thank you for being an amazing volunteer uh, and sailing with us on the world's most exciting classroom. OK, so we are going to go. The last thing we have to do today is our curiosity of the week. So I'm going to make my way through the salon. We're gonna head up to this little work area here. And then I'm gonna go out this exit and put us back outside, back into this little bit of sun, a little bit of ocean. And Jesse, why don't you get um, last week's curiosity uh, for us? Let's watch that and then let's see what this week's is gonna be. Last week, I posed the question of what group of organisms barnacles belong to. Did you have any ideas? Could you work out which group these strange animals belong to? For hundreds of years, naturalists argued over this very question. For a long time, many people thought they actually belonged to the mollusk family. That's the family that includes shellfish, squid, octopus, and other organisms like that. There are many, many species of mussels that grow anchored to the rocks, so it's not difficult to see why barnacles were thought to belong to mollusks, especially because many of them produce small, hard shells that superficially look similar. But if you look at barnacles really closely when they're underwater, for example, in a rock pool when the tides come in, you might see something very strange happen. At the opening here at the top, a strange limb-like appendage unfolds and actually filters the water for particles, which is what the barnacle feeds on. No mollusks have an appendage like that. So Darwin, during his study of all of the barnacles known at that time, and he wrote a monograph of all the barnacle species, worked out that they actually belong to crustaceans. That's the group of organisms that includes crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. Darwin noticed that over millions and millions and millions of years, a shrimp-like organism had actually evolved into the barnacles that we see today. One important bit of evidence that added weight to Darwin's argument was the fact that barnacles have free-swimming larvae just like other groups of crustaceans and unlike mollusks. So we now know that barnacles are actually a type of crustaceans. It's amazing to think how a shrimp-like organism could evolve into these hard structures that we see today anchored to rocks right the way around the world. Did you guess correctly? Let's find out now who won this week's competition. Thank you for taking part.
All right. So we will be sending uh, a message to this week's competition winner. And we're going to have a special curiosity uh, of the week right now. We have a special guest with us. Uh, and it's a little a bit of a nautical theme that we have going here. So we have uh, the ship's captain with us, Jan Willem, joining us. Jan, it's so great to have you joining us live today. Hello, everybody. Yeah, nice to be here live. All right. And so here we go. We have this item here. I'm going to go in nice and close here. We're going to look at it from a few different angles. This is uh, our curiosity of the week. What is this? You want to send a message. You have one week to send us a message to classroom at darwin200.com. Uh, and then, yeah, we're going to see what those answers are. I'm so glad that we have the captain holding it because it's a very important instrument on the ship. There's only one of them and it is fragile. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to have a professional showing us our curiosity of the week. And then, Jan, just before we, we let you go, can you just tell us a little bit about maybe what the sailing's been like this week? Uh, at the moment, we're having uh, light winds. Uh, so. Seems like our light winds temporarily blew our connection out with Joe live on the deck, but I think we just got him back. So we're going to go back to Jan and Joe to answer what the winds have been like. <laughs> All right, there we go. Yes, yeah, so we were saying where the sails, we've been able to put them up during the day. We take them down at night uh, and, and we use the use the engine. Yep. Yeah, yep, that's so correct. we're making good time. We're going to make it to Ecuador, you think? Definitely, we'll make it. Yes, definitely. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for the curiosity of the week. Thank you for everything on the ship. It is absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think this is maybe where we will we'll wrap up for the week. We had quite a jam-packed uh, world's most exciting classroom. Let me switch my camera one more time. A little trip to the Amazon. Then we had Callie joining us talking about Ecuador. We had our Kahoot. We had a little walk around of the ship. Uh, new experiments, a curiosity of the week. So it has been another great time. Maybe just to... Okay, I think I'm back. I'm back. Okay, so yeah, uh, obviously a huge shout out to all of our sponsors, all of our partners uh, who make everything possible for the world's most exciting classroom in the Darwin 200. I'm going to switch my camera one more time and I think that's how we'll end off today. We'll just do a little walk uh, the length of the ship. There we go. All right. So once again, classrooms, thank you for joining us. I'm walking along some of the crew quarters right now. Heading down the steps. Now, I know this might look like a life raft, but this is more of kind of a, uh, a nice item to have on the ship. Our actual life rafts are right here. These big, right here, you pop in the water, they inflate, and then each one can hold 25 people. There's four of them, and since there's only about roughly 26 or so of us on board, uh, there's definitely lots of space, but I don't think that's something we're going to have to worry about. And then if we head this way, you can see we've got some relaxers back here. Excellent. The ship.
Oh, there we go. Oh, I think we just got him back. We got him back. Hey, Joe. We're back. I don't know how long it's going to last, but Elliot from Australia, Elliot, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to really quick. Really quick. Excellent. What's I like to see more, Elliot? Wave the albatross. Wave the albatross. Oh, bottles. I'm a big star here. All right. Okay. Well, I think that about does it for the world's most exciting classroom. I'll turn my camera around one more time here. We'll say goodbye. Uh, and then we'll sign off for this week, and hopefully we'll see everybody again uh, next Thursday. So thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Joe's connection just died right then, uh, finally, to end off our broadcast. So check out Darwin200.com to learn so, so much more. We'll catch you next week. Thank you so much for joining us, part of the adventure, and have a wonderful rest of your day.